Data from the National Bureau of Statistics reveals Nigeria's unemployment rate as at the second quarter of 2020 is 27.1 percent, indicating that about 21.7 million Nigerians remain unemployed. The data also reveals the worst hit are Nigerian youths with more than 13.9 million currently unemployed. Also, the National Commission for Mass Literacy, Adult and Non-Formal Education says more than 60 million Nigerians are unable to read and write in any language. Well, these startling data will form the basis for a robust discussion at this year's ALEX lecture with the theme Literacy, Migration and Insecurity, Nigeria's Population Time Boom. Joining us now for a preliminary discussion on this is a lawyer and senior uh, partner, ALEX legal practitioners and arbitrators, Mrs Ngozi uh, FOB. Uh, glad to have you join us, uh, Ngozi. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, fantastic. Let's, let's start this way. What can we say are the drivers, uh, let's begin there, of migration? And how can we begin uh, to possibly tackle these issues to stop or even reduce migration? There are quite a lot of issues that drive migration. Um, a lot of people are moving out of the country because they're looking for a better life, whether it's in terms of health care, whether it's in terms of education for themselves, for their children, whether it's in terms of... Um, there are just many factors, quality of life, comfort. So there are many things that are currently driving the migration that we are seeing out of the country. Um, and what can we do to stop the migration? Because this is a real issue for Nigeria. The fact it's been called the brain drain, right? Because we have quite a lot of professionals, a lot of young, sharp minds that are very necessary for our economy to grow, live in the country. What we need to do is we need to strengthen our systems. Nigeria needs to make sure that we are able to retain the good minds, the sharp minds that we have within the country. Country. There are a lot of things that need to go into this. We need to make sure that our systems work. The educational system has to work. We need to be confident that our children are going to get the kind of education that they deserve. The society in general has to work. We need to be sure that our children can walk the streets safely. We need to be sure that security is uh, that security is good all throughout the country. We need to be sure that healthcare works. We need to be sure that every system, and this is the thing, is it's a complete overhaul that needs to happen for us to um, stop the, the brain drain, that's the loss of, um, you know, the, of professional minds that we're experiencing in the country right now. There's just a lot that needs to happen in the economy as a whole for us to be able to stench this, uh, uh, this trend. Indeed. And one will be curious to find out why a legal firm as yours is interested in a topic, in a theme like this. What informed this theme and why are you so interested in it? Um, yes, yeah, so like I said, this is something that is very topical and it's why um, the ALEX lecture was founded in the first place. We founded this lecture to give back to society so that we would be able to have conversations that basically revolve around what is going on in the society per time. Um, right now, the issue of immigration, people leaving the country has been very topical and it's also topical because it's not just, we're not losing um, the, the bottom of the ladder here, we're losing top minds, we're losing professionals in all the major sectors across the economy and it cuts across like for our clients for people who we do business with yeah, all the time you have people saying to you um, we cannot find the right people to hire and this is a country of so many people there are over 201 million people existing in Nigeria right now and yet we have our top minds consistently leaving the country in droves so migration is a very topical issue right now and then there are also a lot of other things that are around it which is what the topic is about so it says um, immigration illiteracy um, and security you know and how it relates to Nigeria's population and whether this population is a time bomb in itself for Nigeria. So it, it, we feel that the topic is um, very topical for right now. Security has been on the forefront on the forefront of all the conversations that are being had right now. Illiteracy has consistently been an issue um, in Nigeria because as at right now, and this is for young people, we're not even talking about the older population, just for people under 15 or 15 and above, only 50% of our population is actually currently um, either literate or getting an education. So these are things that we feel are topical and that we want to discuss at the lecture because the lecture was founded for just that very purpose, to discuss topical issues in the society. 
Thank you. And uh, you touched on what I was going to bring up with you, which, of course, is illiteracy, because the statistics are very scary. Uh, the fact that 60 million Nigerians are unable to read and write, it, it makes me very worried about our future. I'm sure it makes everyone very worried about the future of this country. What factors are currently contributing to this extremely high level of illiteracy that we're seeing? And how exactly does the ALEX lecture plan on addressing this proactively? Okay. Um so the top two factors that we've seen that are contributing to the literacy levels in Nigeria, one is the state of the economy. A lot of people cannot afford to give their children the kind of education that they would want. In fact, a lot of people cannot afford to give their children education full stop. They need the children in the farms, they want the children hawking on the streets, they want the children doing all sorts of things. So there's basically a lack of capacity on the part of um, parents, on the part of you know just people in the society in general, to put the young ones, to put people who need to be in school in school. So the economic situation is a basic factor. Another one is um, it's a mix of um, cultural and um um, cultural um, cu cultural influences and information. So there's also still, you know, all the places where people are thinking to themselves, we ne really need to get an education. Is it not sufficient if we can do just anything to get the money? And yes, we know that money is important, but we know that education is so much more important because it, that's, it just, it's just the doorway to everything. So there's quite a mix of factors that goes into why um, the literacy levels are very high, but it seems to us that, you know, the economic factor is a very major one. Um, the knowledge of, you know, the parents um, across the country is another one. And then cultural influences have also contributed to this. Right. Um, yeah. Let's still talk about this uh, migration issue. Uh, uh, in 2007, the urban population exceeded the rural one because, I mean, you were talking about migration in terms of even moving out of the country, but here we're talking about even migration within uh, uh, the, the country from rural areas to the urban communities. In 2007, the urban population exceeded the rural one by, uh, you know, exceeded it. Now, by 2035, uh, an estimated 60% of the world's population will be urban. This is according to the UN. What does this mean for livelihood? And of course, you talk about questions of insecurity. Um, yeah, so it, it means a lot. It means a whole lot. Um, the first thing is we need to start thinking about infrastructure. Um, first, as a matter of fact, the first thing is we need to start thinking about what this, why this urban migration is happening in the first place. And there's a lot of conversation that's been had about decentralization and basically, you know, being able to make sure that places in the hinterlands, that communities that are not necessarily considered urban, have access to all the basic facilities of a society and that economies are moving and working in those places. So those things are important. Otherwise, we're going to continue to see these trends of urban migration. And what about the urban cities that these people are moving to? There's a lot of issues that come out of it. We can use Lagos where we live as a basic example. You're moving to urban places where infrastructure is already overtaxed. Um, you know, facilities are overtaxed. Everything, the, the basic structure of the society is finding it difficult to support the number of people that they have already. Not to mention, you know, if you live in countries like Nigeria and other countries, countries where the population, the number of people in the country is significant, you know, so it's going to be an issue. For urban migration, um, if it continues to happen, the first thing that needs to happen is that infrastructure needs to continue to be scaled up. Policies need to be matching the movement of people. So as people, as people are moving to urban regions and to urban areas, the policies that are going to support the number of people in these places need to be in place. Um, you know, it, the economy as well. If the economy continues to grow, then after a while, people are going to find that it's not as um, profitable. It's not necessarily mandatory for you to move from, you know, like what we consider the local communities to what, um, you know, we consider urban cities. And this is what is going to help that, that decentralization, both of positions, of offices, of structures, of the economy, in such a way that it works well and is inclusive for everybody, wherever they may be located in a country, is going to be very important. And let's talk about that critical question that your lecturer would be seeking uh, answers to this year. Is the population a time bomb? Because ideally, the more people you have contributing to national development and the economy, the better, especially with a youthful population. But in our case, it seems different. It seems the more we become, the higher the burden is. So is the population a burden or a blessing? 
Um, so this is one of the questions that are going to be answered um, at the lecture and it's a very topical question people have been asking is it a blessing or a curse and I completely agree with you um, any any country should be able to pride in their numbers because the population the human population is basically your human capital that's your human resource right there right so we should be able to do quite a lot with the numbers that we have but like i said um where you have these numbers but you don't have facilities to support these numbers it can then start to look like it's a curse because those people are not functioning optimally and like i said it's scary because for us in nigeria this is not just we're not talking about you know we have a significant population of older people who are uneducated or or who do not feel supported by their society that's not the case we're talking about young people here who are supposed to be the future of the country who are supposed to be the minds that are going to take the country in the next direction that it's going to go um, and these are the people that are either leaving the country that don't feel supported by their country that are not getting educated so these questions are or these are the reasons why you know the conversation about whether Nigeria's population is a time bomb whether it's a blessing whether it's a cause this is why it has become you know topical this is why it's being discussed and um, to find out whether or not it's actually a time bomb I, I suggest that you tune into the lecture you'll find out many thanks to you and yes I mean unfortunately having children is still widely seen as culture rather than an economic responsibility which it is but many thanks to you Mrs Ngozi Efobi for joining us today on Newsday to discuss the 2020 ALEX lecture